Before we start with the actual talk, um, first I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Carsten Tellmann. I work for GData Advanced Analytics. Um, GData is uh, traditionally an antivirus company located here in Bochum. Advanced Analytics is a full subsidiary and we are more focused on uh, the service part of the IT security business like the incident response, pen testing, and all that. Um, and we are supporting this course since, I don't know, some years now. Uh, by support, what do I mean with it? We offer an additional evening event for all of you um, at the rooms of our company. Always when we have an external speaker here, we will have such kind of event. Uh, the basic idea behind this, we offer some uh, delicious food and drinks and want to have a platform in a cozy atmosphere where you are able to get in touch with, for example, the speakers like Johannes. So if you are interested in talking about topics a little bit more in detail or longer, um, that's a good option there. Of course, some of my colleagues will be there from the antivirus industry field. Um, a lot of technical people actually, so if you're interested in uh, talking to people working in this branch or, or this kind of company, um, if you're interested in it, in it feel free to, to ask the people around. Um, I can recommend it, but of course you should not ask me because I work there. Ask your colleagues, some of you I've seen there already. Um, yeah, I, I hope uh, you will enjoy the course, and if it is too spontaneous for you today, like I said, next week, next speaker, we will offer it again, and yeah, hopefully you use this opportunity to get a little bit in touch uh, with people that already have their degree and now are uh, confronted with the real world. Um, yeah, here are some details on the slide, but uh, if you want to know anything more about it, uh, then don't hesitate to come to me after the talk. I'm happy to answer any questions. So, enough delay from my side. Let's welcome Johannes for his talk. So. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction, uh, Carsten and uh, Markus. Uh, so, as Markus already said, um, I'm going to talk about our advent calendar of last year. Um, personally, I like advent calendars. Uh, when I was little, I had some uh, Lego advent calendar. Uh, my mom put me little uh, pieces of Lego into advent calendars, and then I could build up like little uh, tools that were, uh, it, like in the end, I got the, the full Lego package. And uh, now I don't play with Lego anymore. I play with security bugs. Um, and um, since I like those calendars, we did one last year. So uh, Markus already introduced uh, most of the stuff. Um, I studied security, IT security here at the Ruhr University, as, as most of you guys uh, do as well. So I was sitting in the lectures as well, and I was learning. And um, 10 years ago, then we founded the Flux Fingers. Um, Flux Fingers, the Capture the Flag team of, um, of the Ruhr University. I see some Flux Fingers t-shirt there, which is awesome. Um, and we played Capture the Flag contests to learn about web security, or I specifically are, uh, were interested in web security. Um, so we played those capture the flag contests, learned lots of um, security bugs and, and those kind of types you learn today in the Hackpra. Um, so two years later, after playing capture the flag contests, we, we founded the Hacker Practicum uh, to give back to the students um, and to teach them a bit more about what we learned during the capture the flag contests. Um, so that was eight years ago, and Hackpra uh, is, is uh, bigger than it was before. So it's, it's really nice to see that it's still uh, active, uh, likely th uh, due to the uh, great support of GData and, and, and Marcus. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and after I spent some time with the Hackfra um, and working as a security consultant and playing capture the flag contests, uh, I figured that I'm, when I'm hunting security bugs and code, I always follow the same uh, principle, the same concept of uh, going manually through the source code and detecting security vulnerabilities. And that was actually the motivation to uh, write tools that help me to quickly identify security bugs in code, because that was the initial goal of winning capture the flag contests or uh, getting money as a security consultant uh, when hunting bugs. Um, so that's what I did. I, I wrote the first open source RIPS version in 2008, released it in 2009 as open source version, developed it two more years, uh, and then I, I figured that the tool actually doesn't really work well for object-oriented code. So I did my master thesis, um, spent another half a year to rewrite a new prototype, and then spent another three years uh, as a PhD to 
uh, develop more techniques uh, that could support object-oriented programming code, uh, second-order vulnerabilities, and the like. And now we founded a company that bases on this new prototype. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, shortly introduce um, some static code analysis techniques, or at least the, the basics. So I give, I give a primer to static code analysis, so you get an idea how actually the tool works that we use to detect those bugs. And um, shortly the advent calendar we released la yes, uh, last year. And then I'm going to uh, show my favorite bugs that, that, um, that we released together with the RIPS team last year. And then we have some conclusion. Um, what, what we learned actually. So let's begin with some uh, basic static code analysis uh, to give you an idea. So basically what we want to have is we want to take some source code and put it into some magic black box um, and the black box should tell us at the end here are security vulnerabilities, right? That's actually what we want to achieve. Um, and we do that by um, analyzing the source code without actually executing it. So we are parsing the source code and we are transforming it into a graph model so that is actually what's happening behind uh, the magic box. Um, and that's just like a basic overview. We are taking the source code, um, tokenizing it in its little parts. Um, whenever it makes sense, we summarize those little parts that we split uh, into blocks. Um, and then we uh, summarize what's happening in those blocks and then we connect those blocks into a graph. And um, that's as, just as a rough overview of how it, how it, how it works. So splitting the source code, um, into blocks, connecting the blocks, and then on this graph model, uh, we can perform data flow analysis, um, and we can follow the generic concept that you, that you learned during the HACPRA sessions, uh, that the security vulnerability always occurs if you have a user input, and that ends up in some sensitive operation. So you learned about cross-head scripting, you have user input that is uh, echoed, for example, so the sensitive operation echo is used, or you have user input, and that uh, flows throughout the program and ends up in a SQL query, um, and then you have a SQL injection vulnerability. And this is the generic um, concept that we are approaching with a tool. To make it a bit more visual, um, we have some simple code here. Um, so you have this sensitive echo here for cross-head scripting vulnerability, and we resolve where ID comes from. And we do that by, um, as I said, splitting the code into blocks so whenever we have an if-else, so we have different control flow, um, we are creating a new block. Then we are taking those blocks and connecting those blocks together to a control flow graph. Uh, so now we can say, okay, this block uh, can flow, the data flow can go from here to there or from here to there, and then both blocks end up in this block. And then we don't need the source code anymore because we transform the source code in an abstract model for analysis. And we perform backwards direct detained analysis, and that means we first look for sensitive operations, for example, echo, and then we look, okay, interestingly, the ID variable is printed here. Let's look where it comes from. Uh, we take the left side, ID is static, nothing really security cri uh, critical is happening here. And we take the right side, and ID comes from user ID. And then we continue looking where does user ID comes from now, and then we see, okay, it comes from user input, and we trigger the security vulnerability report. So we see an attacker can actually inject here into the HTML his uh, JavaScript payload and perform cross-site scripting. So that's the, that's the concept. I wanted to show like a short video um, how that looks for the, for the user. Um, it's just some seconds. So you type in the code pass of um, what you want to scan and the version number. You hit scan and then um, security vulnerabilities so actually the source code is transformed into, into its model in the first phase, and then it's continuing to scan, and the security vulnerability types, such as object injection, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, they will pop up. Uh, and then you can click into those vulnerability types uh, and those uh, categories and select some of them and analyze in detail, okay, how, this, how did this um, security vulnerability occur? So that's this black box or this magic box where you throw in your source code and, and get the security vulnerabilities. Um, that was the initial goal to build something like that. Okay, and now in order to test our tool, uh, for me the security tool only makes sense if it really finds zero day vulnerabilities. Um, so in order to test our tool, what we are doing all the time is we are throwing in open source PHP applications and there are thousands of them. So we have enough test cases uh, to spend with, and once in a while we find some interesting bugs, 
um, that we decided to collect. And so we decided to do an advent calendar. So uh, every day in the advent time, we opened up a little um, uh, calendar gift and shared one of those interesting findings. Uh, to put some statistics, so we've, we found uh, many, many bugs. Uh, we took 20 applications that we found, um, wh where we found the most interesting ones. In total, it was 3.8 million lines of code that were analyzed. Uh, Hendrik of our team uh, took the time to, <laughs> actually did it automatically, of course, but uh, he downloaded all 48,000 WordPress plugins uh, automatically and threw them into RIPs. <laughs> um, so there were more security bugs than, than we could analyze, of course. But the ones that we found interesting and critical, um, we decided to, to publish then every day. So again, those security bugs you're seeing, maybe they are more critical ones, um, simply because they are maybe unauthenticated, um, but still maybe boring, because it's just a SQL injection without any technical trick. Uh, but we decided to take some bugs that are maybe more complex, maybe sometimes then less impactful, but still technically more interesting. And um, Generally, we found about 40% uh, of the issues that we um, were detecting in general um, be cross-site scripting, 20% was SQL injection. Uh, but as you can see from the statistic, what we chose to show there were more SQL injection vulnerabilities, object injections are always uh, interesting. I'm going to show one of them later. Um, and we had the traditional code execution and command execution and file-related bugs. Okay, so here you can see a list. I think over half of the applications that we, that we had here, we could gain a, a command execution in the end. But they were not that simple than injecting uh, user input into a system command. Uh, sometimes they involved a bit more tricky parts uh, and, and that's what actually made them interesting. So we combined them with cross-site scripting, with SQL injection, uh, with a logical flaw, with file upload, etc. So actually those bugs that you uh, have during the, the hack pass sessions. Um, and as I said, I would like to, to introduce uh, my top five favorite ones. Um, so the ones I, I found personally the, um, the most interesting ones. If you want to go through all of them, you can just visit our blog and uh, read the technical blog posts. Okay, so uh, let's begin with the, with, the first, um, with the first software, Roundcube. It's a webmail software. Um, it has over 3 million downloads on SourceForge. I think they moved two years ago to, to GitHub, uh, so there might be even more. Uh, it's average size with 200,000 lines of code. Um, and it, it's pretty interesting, the software itself, because it runs at the Ruhr University, right? So that makes it even a more attractive target, or at least more interesting, I would say. Um, and we could trigger a command execution vulnerability uh, with an email. Uh, the guys at Roundcube did a great job. They patched it in seven days, so they were really professional. Um, and let's have a look what, what happened here. Um, so this is the first security vulnerability I'm introducing. It's not that complex, but still I find it's not that easy to spot because if you're looking for command execution vulnerabilities, uh, then usually you're looking for something like shell exec, system, proc open, um, exec, so functions that actually in their name reveal their executing system <coughs> commands. And what happened in Roundcube actually was that there's user input received from some custom Roundcube functions uh, in the from variable, which is passed along to deliver message. And the, from, the user input from the from field ends up in the fifth parameter of mail. And mail doesn't really sound that suspicious for executing uh, commands, system commands. Uh, but it turns out that in the fifth parameter of the mail function, you can execute system commands uh, because you can um, or you, you cannot execute system commands, but you can pass along additional parameters for the MTA, for the mail transfer agent that PHP uses to send away uh, emails. And that's interesting um, because depending on the MTA, on the mail transfer agent, depending on what features this, um, this agent has, you can pass along parameters that reconfigures the, the mail transfer agent in a way that you can still abuse it and, and, and get uh, command execution. So internally, mail uses escape shell CMD, the function or the functionality of escape shell CMD. So you cannot directly inject, um, typically like command execu execution style bug, you cannot inject own system commands with a semicolon or with backticks because it's, it's internally escaped. 
But if you pass along parameters, um, that, that works. So what you can do then, um, and uh, Robin of our team uh, um, did that and, and did a great job here to, to build exploit. Um, he passes along additional parameters to SendMail and the additional parameter here t tells SendMail to create a log file. And we can specify where the log file for the email that is going to be sent uh, will be placed. And we place this log file in a PHP file in the web directory. And if we then send out an email, a log file is created similar to this one. And the log file contains actually other user input that we are giving along when sending out an email, for example, the subject field. And in the subject field, then we specify our PHP code. So what happens if we send an email um, with this modified parameters and with the subject is this um, log file will be created, the PHP code ends up in the log file. And if we then access the log file on the web directory, it will be passed as PHP uh, and our PHP code is executed. So we have a little demo for this, um, just to make it more nice and visible. You see on the right hand side is the attacker shell. He opened up on port 4444, um, his, his port where he wants to receive the back connect. Um, and then we are a round cube user, for example, at the university. This is of course just a test system. And we are writing a new email and then we are modifying the from parameter. So you cannot do it by user interface, but you can modify the HTML DOM, of course. And we set here the additional parameters to reconfigure SendMail. Um, then we type in into the subject field to make it appear in our log file, our PHP payload. Um, and we write a happy message. And then we press send. And then the backdoor ends up uh, on, the, on the web server, the log file. And if we open it, we get the back connect and we have a shell on the server and can then uh, retrieve sensitive information, config file values, um, et cetera. Okay, so that worked out quite nice. Um, also for the media, it was attractive because you could Actually, I think technically, um, maybe they didn't really know what was going on, but just the fact that an email was hacking an email software, I think, uh, caught their attention. And um, there were quite some, some, some news about this. Okay, second bug, uh, second favorite uh, of my bug in the, in the advent calendar was in FreePBX. FreePBX is a phone system um, software, so it's, it, it's, uh, it's uh, a web UI for uh, business phone systems. Um, on their website, it says they are running on one million uh, production systems, so it's quite widely spread. It has over half a million lines of code. And uh, when we scanned it, we actually found uh, multiple security vulnerabilities, including multiple command execution vulnerabilities. Um, and those, at least the most critical ones, were patched within two weeks. So the guys uh, did some quite some effort uh, to, to patch all the security bugs we shared with them, a RIPS account, and they went through it. Um, and I, I found the, 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 the security bug uh, interesting, um, and I'm going to introduce what happened here in the following. So we have some user input again here, which is a file that is uploaded. And this uh, user input in, in the files area here is passed along through several uh, Methods. And as you can see, if you're, if you're going through this, so you're passing this user input to handle upload file, it's concatenated here into a file name. The file name is then passed along to another method and to another method. You can already tell why I got the idea of automating those things. So what happens actually is that, if, that this upload functionality is to upload a mod for a free PBX. So you can upload a module, um, a custom module to free PBX. And what they, if this, arc, this, this archive file is processed, it's actually verified, um, uh, the signature is actually verified in order to ensure that nobody's uploading a malicious mod because then someone could plant a backdoor into this, this mod um, and that's what they try to prevent. So you can, up, uh, you can upload your, your mod, but the signature of the file is verified um, and here the file name is passed along, and then here you can already see it's passed 
to the minus minus verify parameter, which ends up, of course, in a system command. But since it's not sanitized, um, you could upload a file that contains a payload itself in the name of the file. And then the name of your fi the file ends up in your system command, and you would have a command execution vulnerability. So basically, the functionality to verify the signature to ensure the file is safe had the security flaw itself. Um, and that's what made this uh, security bug uh, interesting to us. So we would upload, for example, with backticks in the file name. It had to be a GPG file, um, but you could um, choose an arbitrary name. Uh, you would inject some backticks, and whatever here in the backticks is invoked as a second command within the actual executed command. And then we would have a command execution vulnerability again. Uh, so now we try to exploit this via cross-site request forgery. Um, however, this uh, did not work because FreePVX has some more well, minor CSF protection. Uh, it still does its job. Um, what they do is they take the referrer and check if the host of the referrer um, is uh, equals to the current server host. And if it is, then the referrer check is okay, and otherwise the referrer is uh, denied, so we couldn't actually exploit it using cross-site request forgery. Uh, but, of course, there were many cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, so one of them is, is uh, shown here. Uh, it's the classic example I think you also had in the, in the bad bank as, as one challenge. So there's uh, HTML special chars without the second parameter end quotes. And that again means that HTML special chars only encodes double quotes, but not single quotes. And since we're here in the JavaScript context with single quotes, we can simply break out of the single quotes, inject our own JavaScript payload, uh, and then we have cross-head scripting. And then we can combine both bugs and send the administrator a link with the cross-head scripting payload uh, where the JavaScript actually performs the upload of the malicious file. So we have a small demo for it. I, I will run it a couple of times because it's, it's running quick. So you see in the, in the upper part, you will see our payload that we are generating. Um, uh, you see our, sorry, our command execution payload, and it will end up in the, in the link that we generate. And then we send the link actually to the, um, to the administrator, or in this case, it's embedded as an iframe. It runs a bit quick. Um, so I played it again. And as soon as the, the link is opened here in an iframe, the attacker receives his shell, um, uh, his back connect, and can uh, execute system commands again. OK, that was my, my uh, second favorite bug in, in the advent calendar. And uh, now we come to the third one, OS class. So OS class uh, had a also, I think, typical bug um, where we could combine a command, or we could gain command execution by using a file inclusion and a file upload, uh, and a yeah, file upload, um, which we have, where we use an image. So OS class is a marketplace software where you can sell your goods. You can set up your own eBay, for example. It has uh, over 25,000 downloads last month, so it's quite popular. Uh, and it's a rather small application. So let's have a look at the code. And the code here is, is actually pretty simple. So we had a straightforward file inclusion, um, as you saw it in the, in the HackPro lessons. And uh, even in real-world applications, it can be that simple, right? So you have some uh, get parameter um, here, the plugin parameter, and it ends up in the include statement. And include includes PHP files. So uh, whatever file you specify here with past traversal or not, it will be included as PHP file and the PHP code is executed. Um, now, in order to exploit it, we use the file upload. And we found an interesting file upload here um, that we're preventing to upload PHP shells itself. So you could only Im uh, upload image files. Um, and then a thumbnail would be generated of it. So we could not directly upload a PHP shell to execute code, but we could upload image files. And those image files would be uploaded, um, and then they would be rotated. So even if we could upload PHP files, the PHP rotate function would likely destroy our PHP file um, or not accept it as a valid image file, um, and then it would fail. But yet again, we could only uh, upload files with a with um, file type extension. Uh, so, of course, what we did is we uploaded an image file that actually contains 
the PHP code in the EXIF metadata, uh, if it's readable. So we have um, here the hex view of this image file, and we placed our PHP code into, into the, the EXIF metadata. And even if the image file is then rotated by PHP functions, the EXIF metadata still stays intact. Um, and uh, we can then use this file to point the vulnerable include statement to our uploaded shell JPEG file. Um, and then the PHP code within this uploaded um, file is, is executed. So that was actually a nice bug. Still, it was in the administrator area. So again, um, we, we used um, a cross scripting payload. So we have again the shell of the attacker on the right-hand side, left-hand side is the uh, administrator that serves to another page or opens up um, a link that is sent via email, for example. Uh, and as soon as he clicks on the email, well, we bit, built in some JavaScript debugging alerts, but of course he wouldn't see any of those. Uh, and it says, I'm uploading the, the, the JPEG file and exploiting the file inclusion. And then our attacker uh, gets the shell again. Okay, so what was even more interesting here is that the, once we exploited the security vulnerability, that it ended up to be a persistent backdoor, simply because the functionality that we were exploiting here is to uh, specify an error plugin. Uh, so we were pointing in the administrator interface where the plugin uh, for, error, for errors is uh, located. Um, and once we did that, also here the install method is called, and the install method uh, actually persistently stores the path to the um, plugin that we specified um, in its plugin list. And those, in this plugin list then is, uh, whenever you open up OS class again, your interface is automatically included and all the plugins are loaded. So once we modified it with a path traversal to our uploaded um, shell JPEG file, this shell JPEG file would be included every time you run uh, OS class again and you would have more like a persistent backdoor in it. So that was fun as well. And speaking about uploads, I, I shifted in um, uh, serendipity. Uh, it's, it's hard to pronounce. Uh, in um, And serendipity had also a file upload. And uh, Hendrik found a really nice, or well, kind of logical flaw uh, that I found really, uh, really beautiful. So I included it into my favorite list. So serendipity is a block software. Um, I think it's more uh, known in, in Germany. I think it's not that popular still, but um, the security vulnerability was nice. And it's only this, this one slide, this code here. So what you could do in Serendipity, again, you had a file upload, and you could upload image files. You couldn't upload PHP shells or anything, so they would make sure about that. They had some, um, I think, some blacklist filters, which is not the right approach to go. But um, still, it wasn't easy to bypass. You couldn't upload an HD access file or like. So let's just say you couldn't upload any malicious files um, than, 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 than images. And we didn't have a file inclusion vulnerability, so we couldn't hide our payload in the, in the image file. Um, so we were pretty much stuck here. Uh, but then again, Serendipity had a file manager where you could rename files and directories. And renaming files wouldn't work, that you would simply upload a JPEG file and rename it to PHP. That didn't work. Uh, but you could also rename or move a file from one directory to another directory. And that is all performed with the same PHP function called rename, which accepts um, directories and files. So what was happening here is if you rename a file, uh, and sorry, if you move a file, you specify the old directory and the new directory. So where is the file currently, and where do we want to move it? And the file uh, information itself is taken from the database. So you specify an ID for the file you would like to move. So you cannot really control the name or the extension of the file. So you cannot rename it uh, to PHP or change the name or the extension. Um, so still, we wanted to change the JPEG, the, the, the something JPEG file into something PHP. Now, how do we do this? If we simply would point um, a new directory and tell the code, okay, the new directory should be something like 
.php at the end, it would still, with the code here, um, append the original name and the original extension of the file. So if we would just re uh, move something JPEG to the new directory, uh, something.php, uh, this would not work because then still the original file would be extended uh, at the end. So, um, but Hendrik found the, the nifty trick that you could upload a file uh, without any extension and just call this file PHP. And now if you have this file PHP in your directory, in your old directory, and you say, I want to move it to the new directory, which is called something dot, then the original name of the file would be appended to the file, and that would be uh, something dot PHP, and then you would have the PHP file, and you could execute your code. So I found this nice as well, and that was uh, my uh, number four favorite bug. Okay, and as the last bug, uh, I chose Expression Engine. Uh, Expression Engine um, is a content management system similar to Typo3 or Joomla, and it's, it's run by Starbucks, Nike, and Disney, according to their website, so it's quite popular, I guess. Um, and we found um, a command execution that where we used a PHP object injection with a gadget chain. Um, now my question is, did you learn object injection in Hackpra already? No. Okay. Uh, then I, I'm um, trying to explain that. So uh, the vulnerable code uh, was again in the administrator interface. Um, the in administrator interfaces are most of the times the most interesting ones, right? Because you have so many functionalities, then the coders try to prevent all those nasty things and then you find the bypasses for it. So. Uh, here, in this case, you could create a new form. Um, so to, to make a new blog post, for example, you create a new form and you want to specify an URL here. And this URL will be de decoded by the decode URL uh, method. And you have your user input going into the decode URL method. And the decode URL method, I'm not really sure why, I haven't checked all the code, but it did an unserialize after a base64 decoded the URL, performed an unserialize on the URL. I don't know why I see some <laughs> head shaking there. Um, so unsrealize is really interesting um, because of two reasons. First of all, we have um, the unsrealize built in the built-in function, um, built-in PHP function unsrealize has a long history of being vulnerable with uh, memory corruption bugs. And um, we have two guys sitting here in the audience that actually uh, found a security vulnerability in unsrealize, so in the PHP core itself. Uh, hacked Pornhub with it and got a $20,000 uh, uh, bug bounty for it. So if you have user input and it gets into unserialized, you can count it as a security vulnerability itself, um, just because there are many, many more bugs. Uh, still, um, we did not have a zero day, we were not as lucky, had a zero day uh, <laughs> ready for unserialized. So we tried to find another way and there's um, there is an exploit way for unserialized called um, property-oriented programming, building gadget chains for a PHP object injection vulnerability. What this all means, um, I'm trying to explain here. So um, this is like code apart from the, from the previous code, just to give you an idea how unserialized and serialized works to understand the functionality, and then we will see how we can actually exploit it. So um, the serialized and unserialized function um, in PHP, um, they can be used to transform data of any format and only, uh, any t data type, um, transform this data into a unified string representation. And that is helpful, for example, if you want to store an object or a nested array into the database, because in the database you can only store strings and um, you, you may have an object or a nested array and want to store those things still in the database. So what you do is, so let's say, for example, you have the class text here with a property data uh, um, uh, assigned with, with, with RUB. And we want to store not only the string RUB in the database or in the cookie, for example, but we want to, um, but we want to store the whole object. So what we do is we serialize this, um, this object. And what we get is this unified string representation. So you can see it's a type of object of type text was the class. Um, it has the property data assigned to this whole university. So it's kind of readable. Um, and then if you unserialize the string again, you regain exactly the object that you created here with the same format. So that's why the feature is there. <laughs> um, 
And now the attacker can, of course, change this unified string uh, format if it's uh, somewhere stored where an attacker can modify it. So if it's stored in a cookie, the attacker can modify his cookie and say, OK, this object should not be of class text. It should be of class standard class. And the data property should not be assigned to RUB. It should be assigned to RIPS. And now if the object is regained by unserialized again, it will not print RUB, but it will print RIPS. Uh, just as a simple example. Of course, you could perform cross-head scripting then here as an example. And now it gets interesting because now if you uh, perform the serialized and unserialized part, then in PHP internally certain magic methods can be triggered depending on what class type here uh, is used. So getting back to our expression engine bug where we had a simple unserialize on the URL, um, if the return of the unserialize here is, for example, used as a string, so we could inject an object here and URL would contain an object, um, but if this object is then used as a string, uh, PHP usually in all kinds of things behaves pretty generous, right? So it tries to resolve the miscoding of the developer as it always does. So if you concat URL with a string and URL is actually an object, then the magic method to string underscore underscore to string of the object is tried to be called if it's defined of the corresponding class type. Um, and this way we can then look into the source code. Do we find specific magic methods with underscore underscore to string that if we inject an object of this specific class type where we found an interesting magic method, this magic method will be triggered. And for example, here is the class link, and it has this underscore underscore two string, so it's a reserved, um, reserved magic method. You, you can optionally declare for classes as a constructor or a destructor, and this will be triggered then. And once this uh, object is injected of class link, and we trigger the two string method, the two string method um, jumps to the render function, and the render function uh, jumped to get URL. And now get URL um, has another call, and it's um, the make function that we could call. And now you can begin to build gadget chains, because if you're calling here the make functions, this property URL is under the control of the attacker, because the attacker is injecting the object into uh, the serialized string. So he's, in, he's, he's under control of the properties, as we saw previously here. I can control the properties, and I can control that should not be a string here, that should be another object. And if I put a specific object here of a speci uh, the specific class type, then um, the make method of this specific class type is invoked. So we can now go ahead, and RIPS does that for you, but you can of course do it manually. You can look throughout the source code and look where are interesting make methods. And we found only one boring one. <laughs> Um, which, is, uh, which was disappointing. So we didn't find a cool gadget chain which would lead us to some command execution or something. And it looks uh, a bit messy, so let's just focus on this part first. Um, this part first um, raised some hopes because we had call user function and call user function or call user func array um, in the first argument uh, receives, you can, sp you can specify which, which class and which method should be called. And this could be abused for command execution because you could call arbitrary um, functions in the code or even built-in functions that would leverage a command execution vulnerability. However, the object um, that, that you could control by property had to be a closure and closures in PHP cannot be serialized. At least we didn't find a way and we, we gave up on this one, unfortunately. Now there was another call user func, func uh, array call at the end of the function. And here again, we were in control of the property that was used as a class name, but the method name was hard coded. It was make again. And we were already jumping here to arbitrary make methods. So it wouldn't make sense to here again, uh, jump to another make method. So we, were, we got pretty much lost and uh, we, we didn't find any other nice make method and there was no other chains or destructors. But what we figured is that if we um, inject a wrong class name here, then the error handler of expression engine would jump in 
and print the class name, the, the wrong class name to the user interface. And there was a simple cross-head scripting vulnerability. <laughs> now granted, uh, performing all this gadget chain stuff for a simple cross-head scripting um, seems to be a bit an overkill, but we didn't find any other cross-head scripting vulnerabilities. So um, we, we had to build that chain. Um, and interestingly, cross-head scripting an expression engine again leads to command execution, because if you have cross-head scripting in expression engine, uh, you can um, enable and disable features in the administrator interface. And here is a nice feature called allow PHP for the templates that expression engine uh, is storing. So uh, as an administrator, you can create new blog posts and you can enable that PHP code um, is allowed to be placed in your blog post. So we can then uh, set allow PHP to on. And um, you cannot read it maybe, but this is our little backdoor we then embed into the template. Um, and then we would have command execution again. And of course, in the end, you have to put everything together to one um, payload chain. So I tried with my uh, art skills <laughs> to, to symbolize it a bit, uh, to, to just demonstrate the way um, how it looks like in the end. So we have the attacker, and he's sending a link to the administrator, which is locked into expression engine. The administrator clicks on the link. Um, we write a session. Uh, we trigger the PHP object injection vulnerability. The object injection vulnerability jumps through the core, through the different methods, until it triggers, in the end, uh, the final uh, make method with the cross scripting vulnerability. The cross scripting vulnerability sends back the JavaScript payload to the browser of the uh, administrator. And the JavaScript payload that is then triggered uh, performs two requests, enabling PHP templates and injecting a PHP payload into the default or index uh, template. And then the attacker can access the block again to have his command execution. So that was fun. Um, we also, of course, made a little video. Of course, you cannot see the nice code jumping, but this is just to prove the backdoor is not here yet. You cannot execute PHP info. The administrator is locked in, then goes uh, to our malicious website. That's all he needs to do. Um, here's the iframe just to, to make it visible that uh, this is executed. It says it's exploiting it. It's injecting the PHP code into the template. Um, and then the backdoor is placed. You can see here the warning, which I mentioned before, that um, the class name was printed to the, to the user interface. The JavaScript payload, of course, not visible. And then if we visit here it's, uh, with our backdoor parameter PHP info, you had a backdoor expression engine block. And that was number five of uh, my uh, most favorite bugs for the, for the advent calendar. OK, um, to summarize everything up, um, shortly why we think that disclosing those vulnerabilities is, is important, um, because we always dealt with, a, with the question uh, specifically as a company, um, are we allowed to share those details? Should we share those details? But I think it's a really important thing, and that's what I wanted to put as one of those conclusions, um, to share the security vulnerabilities. First of all, of course, vulnerabilities should get patched, right? The users should be protected. Um, so for example, the command execution in Roundcube was hidden there for 3.5 years, three, uh, three and a half years. Uh, so um, I think there, well, I'm sure there were exploits during that time already um, available. Um, and it, um, disclosing the details of the security vulnerabilities then not only alerts about the risks of the security vulnerability, but also um, alerts the user what hap what's happening exactly. So if, if there's just a release saying security update, the user doesn't really know, is it critical, is it cross -head scripting, is it command execution, should I update or not? So I think the information are really um, important to share for this reason. And it helps the community to actually learn from the security mistakes that, that others did. So if you would silent the patch, for example, the, the round cube patch, um, would look like this. So you have the diff here, this line is removed and this line is added. So the attackers would find the security vulnerability by the patch anyway, right? It's, it's easy to see if there's some uh, uh, shell escaping going on here that there must be some shell injection bug. Um, by the way, this patch is not sufficient, um, but I'm, not, I'm just going to skip the details of that. <laughs> and um, 
So what actually happened is that once we published the post, we saw some, some, some other open source software actually having the same issue that, that we published. So for example, here the guys of um, Wikimedia that, that power um, Wikipedia and MediaWiki and the like, um, they found, um, and this is a, in a public bug tracker, uh, that they, they don't do escaping of the fifth argument uh, in mail either. So they actually learn from the blog post and could say, okay, now we should patch this as well in our code base. And after we released the security uh, advisory uh, on the 28th of, of November last year, then uh, in the up following weeks, there were more and more open source software having the same issue and more security bugs were found by researchers. Um, and they all got patched, for example, in Send Framework and PHP Mailer and Swift Mailer um, and so on. So um, that just um, as an example of, of how important it actually is to, to share this information. Okay, and lastly, um, shortly to the state of, of um, open source uh, PHP security. So what we also saw is during our uh, advent calendar, we were running some honeypots. Um, attacks happen, that's a fact still. Uh, PHP is the most popular target for, for um, web attacks. And so we were seeing a lot of attacks in our honeypot. And also uh, we saw, for example, in the card where we reported some security vulnerabilities, one day later, uh, they were defaced. It, it was like a happy accident uh, or an unhappy accident. Uh, but um, so it was not related to our bugs, but still it just uh, gave us the impression again that those attacks are just uh, vital. Um, and uh, my feeling about, is, about it is about the open source software security is that uh, those really popular ones as WordPress, Joomla, Typo3, Magento, and uh, let's say the top five, uh, they get regular security audits uh, by professionals, by security researchers. They have a large community that, that check those, those, um, those code lines. But then again, after the top five, uh, whatever you, you put into automated tools, you will still find security bugs. Um, and they don't really have this large community or, or retrieve those um, security audits. And in the industry, my feeling is it's even worse because you work with time pressure, you have a smaller team, you don't have 200,000 uh, community people that look over your lines of code. You just have your small team and they're checking your code lines. Um, so it's, it's even worse. And detecting and fixing all those security bugs is actually important. So we had one case where we reported many security vulnerabilities to the vendor and the vendor decided to only patch the critical ones. There was um, set and rips, they are critical. Uh, and later on there was an exploit in the wild that abused a vulnerability that is actually a medium vulnerability, for example, cross-site scripting vulnerability is rated as medium, um, but still it could be uh, escalated to command execution. Uh, so by only fixing the high and critical bugs, still the software got exploited in the wild. Um, so that's why uh, fixing all those even small and medium bugs is really crucial as we've seen, we can combine them always to something more critical. Okay, as a, as a last slide, um, a bit advertising, if you want to develop with us on the tool, if you want to help us improve the tool, um, if you love hunting bugs um, as, as we do, we, have, uh, we can offer you bachelor thesis, um, student jobs, uh, master thesis. Um, so just join us, uh, hack some PHP code, it's fun. Um, so we are looking for security researchers. If you're into coding, if you program Java or PHP or AngularJS, um, then um, we are happy to, to, to join us um, uh, building, building a great tool. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you for the patience and uh, thank you.